once and then you just somehow play it out. You moved once, it set a new direction. And then the new direction is to just always be compassing. Pay attention to the opportunities that are there and trust that that's where you're supposed to be. And keep going. Don't do things that are insignificant, that are going to waste your time. Be determined to choose things that are going to make your life more abundant and more fulfilling. And though the values that are there, and trust that that's where you're supposed to be. Values will change along the way, and the destinies, the summation of all your destinies, will make up your life journey. Your soul calls your life's journey. Your mind plays with the destinies. Your physical body will adjust them. You will refine them along your way. That's how you master your life. So when your compass moves you one more time, what do you do? You celebrate it. You welcome the challenge. You take a deep breath, you put a smile on your face, you look up and you go, I'm going to do it. I'm going to find out what's in me. I'm going to go forward and accomplish this. And as I do that, I will keep growing. I'll keep stretching. I'll keep uh, daring something worthy. My favorite phrase, dare something worthy. As your compass moves you, go with the flow. That's your divine mission. Gratitude is one of the most important emotions that we can hold in our life because it recognizes that we are living in harmony with the universe and accepting what the universe has to offer. And in this way, the universe provides us more of the same. Gratitude is essential because gratitude is synonymous with appreciation. What is appreciation? Appreciation is simply increasing in value. For example, your house, when it appreciates, what's it doing? It increases in value. So when you appreciate something, you are automatically increasing its value. If you don't have gratitude for something, it might as well not exist. Somebody who isn't grateful for all the blessings that they have right now is not aware of how lucky he or she is. And so when you take the time, when you take just a few moments to think about one little thing that you're grateful for, a flower, being able to breathe, being alive, that is magic in itself. And that is really the beauty of creation. That's the beauty of our lives. It was Henry James who said that nothing of the senses can satisfy the soul. The only thing that can satisfy the soul is thank you, I love you. When you get up in the morning and you can say thank you, I love you in front of the mirror, and also to the world around you and the people around you. Now, you're going to have fulfillment. I think we take for granted um, all of our life's gifts. And being grateful is a launching pad to have more and to be more and to accomplish more in your life. Gratitude is actually the grace of life. The more gratitude you have, the fuller your life will be. So we must wake up each and every day with a sense of gratitude, with a thanksgiving, not just for Thanksgiving during the holiday, but a sense of thanksgiving throughout our entire lives. It should be a part of our lifestyle because we have so much to be thankful for. It's not just a palliative that you brainwash yourself with in order to get through troubled times. It's the... It's sort of like the sign that, wow, you're finally experiencing reality clearly. Gratitude is appreciation. It's love expressed. It feels good to the one who's feeling grateful, and it's beneficial to those who are mm, in receipt of it. I remember hearing all about gratitude and I sat in my room and I was in a dumpy little place and I think I had a car that broke down a lot and I was struggling to pay my rent which was probably $200 a month and I was very unhappy but I was trying, I was trying, I was trying probably just like you. And I remember picking up a pencil, a simple number two lead pencil 
And I thought, okay, let me try to be grateful for this. And I was resistant to the whole idea. And I looked at it and I said, yeah, okay, with this pointed end here, I guess I can write a grocery list. I can write a, a romance letter. I can write a novel. I can write a suicide note. There's all kinds of things I can do. And I started to shift a little bit. And I thought, well, that's kind of amazing that this little piece of wood with this little piece of lead, I can actually do things that would change my life. I can write affirmations with it. I can write intentions with it. I can write out my vision with it. I can write out all kind of things. And then the other end, if I didn't like what I wrote, I can erase it. And you notice I'm smiling now as I think about it because I'm remembering the first time I actually did this, I began to feel genuinely grateful for the pencil, for the pencil. And as I felt grateful for the pencil, I would look around my room and I'd go, there are people that don't have this. Not only a pencil, but they don't have a roof over their head. They don't have a little refrigerator. They don't have a car. They don't have any money. The way I was living, even then, with all of my complaints, all of my struggles, was better than many people in third world countries. And often I was living better than kings and queens that were ruling countries in past times. And as I realized all of that, I changed. Now today I have this wonderful lifestyle. I have a car collection and I have all these books out and I have a country estate and I have a hot tub. And every night I get in that hot tub and I look at the stars and I count my blessings. I say thank you because I'm grateful. But it all began with a pencil. of 2005, uh, I woke up in the morning with what I thought was a bad case of the flu, and Carol, who was just my girlfriend then, insisted that I go to the hospital, and I went to the hospital, and uh, they didn't know what was wrong with me, and when I woke up three weeks later, I was in a different hospital and had no hands and no feet. I was born in Portsmouth, Virginia in 1954. My dad was a, in my opinion, a Navy hero. He was in Pearl Harbor when it was bombed. And uh, I was raised the first three years of my life in Washington, D.C., moved to Chicago when my dad was stationed in the Navy base, uh, the Great Lakes Navy base. And then because of the health, health of my mother, who was a rheumatoid arthritic, we moved to Arizona in 1959 to keep her on her feet, and she stayed on her feet for another 30 years after that, so that was a good choice. In 1985, I was in my backyard, and I was shot in the back by a little boy that was playing with his dad's rifle, and he was shooting at his back fence, and I was on the other side. And the bullet went through the fence and hit me in the side, and it shattered my spleen and entered my backbone. But that happened in 1985, and... Uh, because I had no spleen, then 20 years later, in April of 2005, I contacted an illness that uh, uh, caused my amputations. Jeff was in a coma in the hospital, and everyone was telling me, all the medical professionals were telling me that he was going to die, that he wasn't going to make it. And I had accepted that as a very likely fact, but... They wanted me to sign a DNR, and I couldn't do that. I just knew that Jeff wouldn't want me to do that. I went outside. I was a smoker at the time, and I went outside and sat on my smoking bench, and one of the nurses had given me a bookmark, and on this bookmark there was a poem that says, Don't Give Up. And I read it, and it moved me, but I put it in my purse and went out for a cigarette, reached in for a cigarette, and every time I reached in my purse, I came out with the bookmark. And I kept looking at it and putting it away. And then I realized that that was it. I had to just not give up. Now you have to understand that every 
medical professional at that time was coming on down on her pretty hard. Let this man go. His life is not worth saving at this point. I don't, even, I don't even think we can save his life, even if we tried. And she was the one that said, no, you are going to do everything you possibly can. When the surgeon came in and looked at Jeff and said, he looked at him for maybe 10 seconds, and then he turned and walked out of the room saying, I'm not going to do it. I ran after him, grabbed him by the shoulder, and turned him around and said, you have to do it. Someone has to do it. And he said, no, he, he'll die on the table. I'm not going to do it. And I said, he'll either die on the table or he'll die right there in the room. He, he has to have the surgery. He can't live without it. He said, he's going to wake up with no hands and no feet and hate you forever. And I said, so be it. And I hate this woman so much that on June 11th, 2005, just barely over two months after this happened to me, while I was still in the hospital, I asked this woman to marry me. And we were married by the hospital clergy in room 105 in telemetry, in the same hospital in which the amputations happened. When I had woken up and realized that I had no hands and feet, I, get, I was really inundated with visitors, uh, colleagues, ex-students from years back that I didn't even remember. But I remember one of the department heads that I had came in and he said to me, Jeff, uh, you're at a crossroads right now. You can either lay there and feel sorry for yourself or you can use this as a springboard to go out and change lives. It was a wonderful positive thing to say. And I can remember while I was awake, my principal had called me up several times. And he called and talked to me on the phone, he told me about the wonderful things that were happening at, happening at the high school where I was teaching. But he always finished up the conversation with, can you give me some sort of timeline for when you're going to be back in the classroom? When all the medical professionals were asking me to apply for Social Security and go on disability, and he didn't give me that option. Every conversation ended up with, I need to know when you're going to be back in the classroom. And less than eight months later, I was sitting in his office getting ready to start teaching again full time in January. I will never, ever believe that God did this to me. But I do believe in my heart that God kept me around for a reason. Something that I really live my life by now is I'm not going to let the things that I can't do get in the way of the things that I can do. And there's a lot of things I can't do, but there's a lot of wonderful people out there that have, have helped me through this. A lot of new wonderful people that I've met and a lot of wonderful people that I've yet to meet. And life is it's wonderful. One thing I would like to leave you with, gals remember from the music man when uh, Professor Harold Hill was waiting for Mary and the librarian to come meet him at the footbridge. And she came down and she said, I almost didn't come. Uh, I think we should do this tomorrow. And he said, oh, Miss Marion, if you pile up enough tomorrows, all you'll find is a bunch of empty yesterdays. And for those of you that have anything wrong with you at all, whether it be an amputation, whether it be a loved one you lost, any crisis in your life, don't start piling up empty yesterdays. Get up and live. Because you get one get-go in this world, and that's it. So we find ourselves having the same New Year's resolution year in and year out. And that is because until you get a new you, you will never have a new year. I'll repeat that. Until you get a new you, you will never have a new year. So I encourage people to get in tune with themselves and to find a way to get to that great self that they know is buried down deep inside of them. And it takes time. It's a process. It doesn't happen overnight. The reality is we live in a society where we're standing in front of the microwave patting our feet. And we want everything like yesterday, but success is a process. So be patient and know that your time will come. What would you do 
If you knew you couldn't fail, that's when you use your compass. That's when you trust that your compass is there to guide you, and you go for it. It is extremely powerful to set your own compass, be true to your own highest values, be clear on your own inspirations and vision, and follow the path with a machete and create a completely new trail that's true to you. Keep this in mind. For every moment you spend focusing outside of yourself, trying to find an answer, you're sacrificing one minute that you could be looking inside yourself where the answer has been there all along. Imagine you're going down a two-lane road. You have speed bumps on both sides that tell you when you're going out of your lane. As long as you stay in your lane, all is well. You're following your path. When you hit one of the bumps on the right or on the left, all it is is a little jolt. It's waking you up to say, oh, get back in your lane. Stay on your path. Follow your compass. It's not thinking about the ideas. It's not becoming aware of the ideas. The most important part of our life is actually putting the ideas into play and using them to run our lives. That makes all the difference in the world. How many opportunities are you missing? They're right there, right in your backyard that you're not acting on. Listen to your intuition, what is called the still inner voice, that little voice that will always guide you to do the right thing for you. Never go against your intuition. When you listen to your intuition, when you listen to your heart, there's some great power in the universe that will guide you unerringly to doing the right things and being the right person in the right place for you. Confronted by a challenge, and you feel you're literally hanging from a cliff, instead of focusing on the fall, it might be wiser to focusing on how it strengthens your hands. It's making you determine what you really want in life, your goal, and maybe giving you an opportunity to show that you can conquer any obstacle and actually go from the cliff hanging to rising above the cliff and getting to the peak. flow of the movement, it'll feel like you come to life. It'll feel like you come to life once again. So remember, every time the sun touches your face, you can understand and know that you are special. As long as we're moving in the direction of our goals and our dreams and we hold on to our vision, we will achieve every single goal, and you will achieve every single goal that you have. sometimes, we still cry sometimes, but we carry on, we feel, we see, we talk, we live. I am strong, I am confident, I am here, I am ready. When the end comes for you, let it find you conquering a new mountain, not sliding down an old one. Many people die at age 25 and don't get buried until they're 65. Your life has value. Decide with the compass of your life that you're going to make a mark, that you're going to live your life in such a way that long after you're gone, buried in your grave, the impact of your life 
will continue to show up long after you are gone. Oh, 